Solar power is one of the main props of the drive to a cleaner, greener future. That's what we're told by governments around the world. But the big question is for us today, is it too late to get into the opportunity as an investor? Well, Stephen Durkash is with us now. He's an advisor to Han ETF and uh, runs the Solar Energy Usits ETF, which has a ticker TAN. Stephen, welcome. Thanks, it's, Jeremy. Uh, good to be able to catch up with you. We're talking about this all the time, it has to be said. But because we're talking about it all the time, it did occur to me that perhaps maybe we might have passed the initial flourish to get into this sector. How do you view where we are and the opportunities? Well, I think it's actually it's actually early, although I do understand uh, that there could be maybe some fatigue given the, mm. the amount of uh, talk about ESG and some of the pushback about ESG. But uh, solar is a mega growth trend. Um, we look at this as a, you know, from a capitalist, from an investment standpoint, it happens to be uh, clean energy. But, uh, you know, 2020 solar went up three or four times, uh, solar stocks in our solar index. So it had a huge run up since then. It's gone pretty much sideways. Mm. So we actually think it could be due for, a, you know, for another run higher, depending on where cost of capital is going. Interest rates are a big uh, a big factor when you look at long duration assets like this. I want to take a look at the the price chart in just a moment. But um, before then, uh, my understanding is this is the, the first solar energy ETF in Europe. Is that right? That's correct. Um, have we, are we a bit behind on this side of the Atlantic compared to what's happening in the States? Is there a comparison to be made about where the United States are compared to where Europe is? From a solar perspective? Mm -hmm. um, well, China is actually the leader. Ah, so okay. China, from a production standpoint, has about 90% of the supply chain, um, and they make up about 50% of the demand for solar. China was always a net importer of oil and gas. They want to get away from that. So they've invested heavily in both the production side and the use side. Now you're starting to see, both here in Europe and in the U.S., with the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of policy support and a lot of money being put into the sector. Mm. My understanding is you're, you're targeting just solar. Uh, explain more about the fund, the makeup what it looks like and the sort of areas you're investing in within this subsector. The, uh, so the fund itself is actually well diversified from a supply chain standpoint. If you think about the supply chain for solar, you have the raw material is polysilicon. There's polysilicon producers. Then you go into the ingot. Then that goes into the cell. That goes into the module. And finally, you have developers. The developers will sell the electricity into utilities or into private companies, Google, that type of thing that are using data centers, a lot of use for electricity. Um, so it's a well-balanced portfolio, has about um, a third coming from Asia, um, Hong Kong shares. We don't have anything in the A share market, local Chinese. Uh, so Hong Kong offers good corporate governance. Uh, you have Korea, Taiwan, that makes up about 30, 35% of the portfolio. Then you have Western Europe, another third, and then North America, the final third. So you're vertically integrated within the sector and you're globally covered. That's right. Um, and um, my understanding is that you have what I think the, 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 the handout that I got says is unique uh, modified equal weighting structure. What's the benefit of doing it that way? The benefit, okay, so I actually come from an active management background. Yeah. Um, this is a passive index. For active, the trend today is to go to more concentrated allowing the active manager to have impact where the conviction lies. Passive, I believe it's more appropriate to an equal weight index because you're trying to get broad access to a theme. You're not trying to put you know, large weights on any one company. Um, so we do an equal weight methodology. Average weight of the portfolio for any one security is about 3%. But what we do is we look for pure play solar companies um, that has 60% or more of their revenue coming from solar. Okay. Large majority, about 85% of our companies are these pure play companies. We do have a small portion, about five of our companies are what we call non-core. They get a half weight in the index. Um, companies like, like Tesla. Why Tesla? Because they own Solar City. If it were spun off, it would be an important solar company. But as part of Tesla, it's not making up a huge part of their revenue. But we want to include it because it does have exposure. Uh, but again, it gets a half weight. And so overall, uh, we have about 40 companies, um, and we think it's the appropriate way. You know, some of some ETFs out there might have a market cap weight. You have 11, 12 percent in any one company. 
for a passive index, I, th I think it's much more appropriate to go balanced. Mm. As someone that manages a fund, are you, you, you say you were an active fund manager. Does this imply that you're no longer active? Now you've got the fund up and running, it's just a question of monitoring it, or are you constantly looking for a new opportunity? Well, for, for this index and on the ETF side, it's, it's completely passive. We are looking for new opportunities. I do, I still do wear an active hat on another business, um, but for the passive indices, the way we do it is we rebalance once a quarter uh, we're constantly looking for new companies that may have IPO that meet the market cap and liquidity threshold to be included. Um, and then it does get screened out by a, by a third party ESG specialist company for any, for any ESG concerns. Uh, so we run it by them as a final check. When you say ESG concerns, what sort of concerns you faced with? Uh, labor supply chain coming from China is a big one just to make sure that it's all being done appropriately, not using uh, any questionable labor practices, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me bring up a, a price chart because uh, this is um, uh, the direction of travel. You said, you know, we're talking at the start about the fact that, you know, there might have been an initial um, interest in this. And I think you can see it's demonstrated by this drop, drop down into the beginning of 2022. And I think it's fair to say within the band, we've been fairly well banded. Although the, the low point, I think, what was that? May 2022 down at 595. Uh, and then the peak up at 868. But here we are now around about the 660 level. What is your, your, your thought on direction of travel? I don't know how much you can say about where you think this is going. And obviously you're in a position where you're obviously uh, um, selling the fund, I suppose, really. So you can't say too much in that regard. But what would give it the upward impetus? What do we need to see from governments around the world or from extra uh, incentives to get into solar? Because, as you said, there is now fatigue, I think, amongst some governments here in the UK, as one of them, of course, have been persuaded that maybe, you know, we should now lose that 2050 target and, and, and move elsewhere. Well, I think, OK, there's three main drivers of solar today. First is a cost standpoint. In most countries and most, most regions around the world today, solar is the cheapest form of energy out there. If you were going to build a new production plant today, um, you would consider solar, depending on your, your other you know, inputs, if you had a natural gas plant nearby for peaker, they call it, you would consider solar based on cost. It's now the cheapest form of energy out there. Um, that's the first main driver. Second main driver is the policy around the world. Um, so all three of the most important regions, China in their latest five-year plan, Europe with the uh, Repower EU and the Green Deal, and, the, and in North America with the US and the Inflation Reduction Act, are investing hundreds of billions of dollars into clean energy. Um, and that includes solar, it includes battery, et cetera. Um, the third and final was the catalyst and a main driver is energy security. So Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, really woke up Europe especially to, to the fact that they needed to, to diversify away from cheap Russian oil and gas for their industrial policy. So it's a confluence of these three things. Um, the other big thing that I would mention that's less of a secular driver, solar is expected, by the way, to double in the next two years. It makes up about 4% of energy worldwide today. It's going to go to about 8% in the next two to three years and then to 16% by the end of 2030. And then expectations are about 40 um, 40 to 50 percent um, by the year 2040, 2050. That's an interesting stat. What's going to drive that? Is that new technologies within this subsector of, of solar or is it existing technologies being more widely adopted? It's, it's, it's both. I mean, there will be increasing efficiencies, but it's also, um, it, it's a relatively mature technology, mm. relatively. So it's going to be just more widely, adopt, uh, widely adopted rates. Um, better grid infrastructure, more connections. Um, but again, it's being driven by cost. We would not be having this discussion if it were five, 10 years ago. The cost has come down 90% over the last decade. So solar, again, is the cheapest form of new energy out there on what they call a levelized cost of energy. The other big thing, I think, is to talk about the cost of capital. Mm. So solar in 2020, our solar index went up about three or four times. As interest rates have been coming up over the last couple of years, the chart, as you showed, has been going sideways. Um, solar is largely project finance. I mean, yes, we have rooftop solar, which I think most people think of, but the, the large scale project finance uh, solar farms are, are a huge part of this. And those are largely um, dependent on cost of capital. So if you think that inflation is now more under control, and if you think that the central banks around the world are gonna be uh, more benign in their policy, either keeping rates where they are or even bringing them down, Solar as a long duration asset should should be very well positioned uh, to benefit from from cost of capital being more behaved. Yeah. 
Luke, it's a pleasure. We've got to leave it there, but thanks indeed for joining us. This introduction to the uh, TAN, uh, which is the ticker symbol for solar energy use, it's ETF. That's uh, Stephen Durker. She's a uh, partner with Han ETF, uh, governing and administering uh, that fund, which you can find on the IG platform. <laughs>